Welcome to the Tony Davis High Voltage Laboratory, which is part of the Electrical and Electronic Engineering Group at the University of Southampton. One of the biggest things we take for granted is that electrical energy is always available. We become very dependent on a system that was developed in the middle of last century to provide lighting and power in the home. It is difficult to imagine how we would cope if for any reason electricity became unavailable. How do we charge our phones, laptops and other devices? How do we store our food? In terms of the supply of electricity, we face two global challenges. The first is ensuring that we develop and expand our sources of renewable generation to ensure that the process of creating bulk electrical energy is environmentally sustainable. The second challenge is less well known. We need to ensure that our ageing electrical transmission and distribution networks continue to work reliably so that there is operational security of supply. The Tony Davis High Voltage Laboratory is addressing this challenge through its research and commercial testing activities. One of our main themes of work is concerned with developing the understanding of the processes that cause electrical equipment to fail. With this knowledge, we are developing new techniques to monitor and assess the condition of in-service high voltage plant, with the aim of identifying developing faults before it's too late. One of the things that makes the Tony Davis High Voltage Laboratory unique is that we have a multidisciplinary team working on these issues, not just electrical or electronic engineers. To give you an idea of the diverse research work that is carried out here, you should start by visiting the satellite engine test chamber. The computational modelling of physical phenomena can only go so far and under more extreme conditions there is a need for more fundamental information. This area is being used to develop new satellite engines which use electric propulsion. They are designed to provide a small force for an extended period of time. They've been used on the SMART-1 spacecraft, which was the first of its type to orbit around the moon in 2004. The engine works by ionizing a gas flowing through a hollow cathode with electrons, and these form a plasma which can reach up to 2,500 degrees Celsius. The high speed of ejected plasma makes this engine very efficient. The hollow cathode inside this vacuum chamber is part of a project funded by ESA in collaboration with Kinetic and Mars Space Limited. It can provide a thrust of up to 1 mN, which is less than the force required to hold a 5p coin in your hand. Our research consists of investigating how these devices can be used as standalone thrusters on spacecraft performing station keeping. As they are much lighter and powered predominantly by solar energy, spacecraft using this engine system can remain operational for much longer. Back here on Earth, Polymeric insulation is a vital part of the electrical power industry and consequently a great deal of research is dedicated to designing robust materials which have to withstand harsh electrical and environmental conditions. Here is a cross section of a cable. The area of interest for us is the polymer insulation in this region which electrically isolates the conductor from the sheath here. Here in the materials preparation room we develop new blends of polymeric materials that have improved properties such as thermal conductivity, mechanical and electrical strength. These are crucial to their use in cable or other electrical systems. Solvent blending allows us to prepare polymers and composites in a solution phase with a much larger quantity of filler. This enables the design and fabrication of new nanocomposite materials that exhibit customised properties when compared to traditional materials. Once a material has been manufactured, it is pressed into uniform samples for testing and characterisation in other parts of the laboratory. By thoroughly understanding the chemistry of polymers, application-specific materials can be tailor-made and tested on a small scale before scaling up to commercial quantities. This is the analysis room, where the basic properties of samples are measured. For example, most of the materials in the lab are made to insulate electrical components. Measurements of crystallisation, melting and glass transition temperatures can tell us thermal limits to prevent a dielectric from changing its form during operation. These tests can be done using a differential scanning calorimeter like this one. Many insulating materials can have negative charges injected under an applied electric field. These trapped charges are referred to as space charge and they enhance the electric field reducing the insulating properties of a dielectric. If you follow me over here I will show you the space charge experiment. This pulsed electroacoustic measurement system is used to examine space charge dynamics within samples. It has been developed for DC field applications where the build-up of space charge possesses the greatest problems. 
Combining both these thermal and electrical challenges, the task of understanding the electrical properties of a material at a variety of temperatures can be achieved by using dielectric spectroscopy. This allows a sample to be heated, or cryogenically cooled, whilst measuring the electrical permittivity and other properties simultaneously. With thermal and bulk electrical properties understood, we now come into the microscopy room. In order to better understand the changes in materials due to ageing, it is often helpful to analyse samples microscopically and spectroscopically, both before and after testing. Microscopes provide a unique insight into the structure within the bulk material. As an example, electrical breakdown trees can be investigated by taking a thin slice of the branching structure. A microscopy suite also enables us to check the quality of our samples such that we may improve the production techniques being used. Once the underlying material structure is understood, the application-specific properties, such as the dielectric breakdown strength, needs to be measured under both AC and DC fields. The dielectric breakdown strength reflects the ability of an insulation material to resist decomposition under voltage stress. The equipment in this room enables us to apply a ramped voltage to very high levels and find the point at which a low resistance path through the material is generated. At this point, the material is said to have broken down and is no longer insulating. We also have a climate control chamber so that test materials and equipment can be exposed to realistic operating conditions. These cages behind me are used by researchers and project students for small-scale high-voltage experiments. All of these facilities are isolated and interlocked to protect the people working on them. Standard research tests can also be useful to investigate real network components such as this cable. When the localized region of the insulation is momentarily breached, a partial discharge occurs, this generates RF signals which can be used to identify where the witness is, what it might be, and its impact on the future performance of the cable. Welcome to the main hall control room. This section of the laboratory provides the physical separation of equipment that is required for testing at even higher voltages. The equipment can be configured in a range of ways in order to produce the required voltage waveform for the test and is safely controlled from here. The work in this hall is typically split between commercial testing and our larger scale experiments. We have three main voltage sources available to us, consisting of a 1 million volt impulse generator, 600,000 volt DC sets, and a 300,000 volt AC transformer. The larger rig over there was designed to investigate failure mechanisms within interface region of large power transformers such that effective methods of conditioning monitoring could be developed. The salt fork chamber is used to test the performance of outdoor insulation hardware such as bushings and sheds that you might have seen at city substations or suspending overhead lines. By working closely with companies such as National Grid, Scottish Power and Centrica, we have gained greater insight into the technical challenges being faced on the power networks. Much of the research activities has involved MSc and undergraduate students in some aspects of part of their final year projects with the number of international publications subsequently being produced. So this has been a brief overview of the laboratory and some of our capability. I hope this has provided you with some insight into the range of research and testing we are applying to address the energy needs of the future. <laughs>